Good morning, Bimblers. All 1,025 of you. Yeah. We reached our target. And you join me at the banks of the River Mersey over in Birkenhead. That's right, we're back in the Wirral. One of my best performing videos was my Wirral Way video. That was our third ever bimble. So I thought it was about time that we visited again. So let's stop messing about and let's bimble. Up until 1974, this was all part of Cheshire. It's now part of Merseyside, which makes a lot of sense. But the place just north of here, Wallasey, that gets its name from an old Germanic word, Wall has. And in Germanic, that means foreigner. And that's also where Wales gets its name. Wales means foreigner as well. And those old Germanic people thought that Wallasey was part of Wales. Originally Wallasey was separated from the mainland of the Wirral by a wetlands known as Wallasey Pool. And it was Wallasey Pool and the River Burkett which made up this behind me, the Great Float, or to be more exact, the West Float where we are now. It's a docklands that goes two miles inland here in Birkenhead and it gives you four miles worth of key to park up your boat. It was built over nine years between 1851 and 1860 by a man named James Meadows Rendell. He was a student of Thomas Telford. We spoke about him before. In fact, him and Thomas Telford went down the River Mersey to Runcorn and surveyed for a suspension bridge, which never ended up happening. They had a transporter bridge instead. If you're a geek like me and you like going and looking at boats, you should come to Birkenhead. You could have a bimble just round the docks. In fact, there's a boat just behind me. It used to be a Royal Fleet Auxiliary ship by the name of Fort Rosalie, but it was sold off and it's now called the Abu Simbel. Lots of people think it's abandoned, but it's not, it's just not moved for a while. And there's another thing just round the corner that looks abandoned, a Blackpool tram, 626 for all the tram spotters. Lest we forget that Birkenhead was the first place in the UK to have a street tramway. And in 2010, Blackpool Transport sold them a tram. You could just have a bimble round here today. Lots of interesting things to see. But we must bimble. Let's bimble. Seal black sky Soaking up this perfect treasure 
That was quite the bimble, that bimblers. A lot of unexpected twists and turns. Not enough signs. And I wasn't expecting there to be a lake in the middle of the cycle path. And it seems to have been there for quite some time. That goose was very at home. But we've made it to Bidston. And we've climbed up to the top of Bidston Hill. Bidston Hill used to be owned by the Massey family of Dun and Massey. You know, the one near Altrincham. We visited there a few times. In fact, we're probably going to visit there again at some point this year. On our National Cycle Route 62 bimbles. We're still doing them. It's just been a while. They sold the hill to Henry IV, the Earl of Lancaster, John of Gaunt's son. And he bought it on behalf of a John Lestrange. And it was passed down to many posh lads and sold off to many rich lads. Until a man named Sir Robert Viner bought it. Sir Robert Viner made a lot of the crown jewels for the royal family. In fact, in some of the ceremonies today, they still use some of his crown jewels. Not only did he make jewellery, but he was also the Mayor of London during the Great Fire of London, which must have been rather stressful. Samuel Pepys wrote in one of his diaries that he went to visit Robert Viner. And whilst he was there, Robert showed him something rather strange. One of his slaves, a young boy, had died of consumption and he'd had the boy's body baked in the oven so it wouldn't rot. And that way, he could show it to all of his friends when they came round for dinner parties. Odd kid. In 1894, Birkenhead Council bought Bidston Hill and they made it nice so that people could look at it. You also have an observatory with a telescope for studying the cosmos. But its main use in those days was to accurately track the time. And they used to fire a gun at one o'clock every day. And that would tell all the boats in the docks what time it was. Very important to have the correct time. They did that up until 1969, when I'm guessing everyone got a wristwatch for Christmas or something like that. Next to the observatory is a very cute looking lighthouse. You know I love a lighthouse. The last time we came to the Wirral, we've seen at least three lighthouses. Only one today, but that's enough. Both the observatory and the lighthouse are made of the sandstone that Bidston Hill is made out of. Obviously everything in the Mersey Valley used to be a desert on the equator. Yada yada, I've said it all before, but that's why there's so much sandstone and so many sandstone buildings. There's a very curious thing carved into the sandstone of Bidston Hill that was carved in 1000 AD by some Irish Norse fellas. It's a sun goddess. It doesn't look very impressive on camera, but it's very interesting and worth coming up the hill to have a look at. Apparently it faces towards sunrise on Midsummer's Day. That's the longest day of the year. But it's not the longest day of the year today. So we best get bimbling. Let's bimble. I don't think National Cycle Route 56 is finished off, Bimblers. At least the signs aren't. I keep going the wrong way. The signs they have got are rather bleached by the sun. 
and it's hard to read which direction you're supposed to be going in. And some of the signs point directly in the middle of intersections. So you have to guess and go downhill a long way, only to have to come back uphill to go the right way down the National Cycle route. It just proves to me how it's meant to feel. We have motive, we have the time. We were meant to lead extraordinary lives. It changed with time. It's certainly a mixed bag, this road. One minute you're on a housing estate. The next minute you're on a farmer's field. And the next minute you're on a country lane. One thing that has to be said. Not knowing where you're going as a videographer. Can be a bit frustrating. But as a cyclist and a bimbler. It's fantastic. And so, at last, we reach Journey's End, Park Gate. We've bimbled here in the past. I went between Chester and Park Gate, down the River Dee. And I told you all about how Park Gate used to be a thriving port, back before Liverpool took off, and after the Romans left Chester. And I told you all about the Stone Quay, now the waters of the River Dee used to lap up against it. And how it's all marshland now. And it's only at very high tides that the waters of the River Dee meet with the quay. We mentioned in that video that one of the buildings here in Parkgate has Nelson wrote in front of it. And because of Parkgate's maritime past, it usually gets associated with Lord Nelson. You know, the fellow that beat the French at battleships. But it's not got anything to do with him. He does have a tenuous link with Parkgate, but nothing major. The story starts with an Albin Robert Burt and he had a holiday home here in Parkgate with his wife Sarah and their eight children. No telly back then you see. Albin Burt made most of his money painting portraits and him and his family lived in Chester in what I imagine was quite a posh house. But they used to come to Parkgate to relax just like people do these days. On the 5th of December 1822 Albin Burt took his nine-year-old son over to Liverpool from Ellesmere Port. They took a packet steamer and spent the day in Liverpool. The weather was quite bad that day, with it being December. And on the way back, 
they boarded the PSS Prince Regent and it steamed all the way back to Ellesmere Port but the weather was too bad to moor up so the captain decided they would need to turn back to Liverpool but when they got back to Liverpool the tide had gone out so they couldn't moor up there either Liverpool wasn't actually such a posh port back then it was much more like Park Gate here a stone quay heavily dependent on the tide so they were stranded in the middle of the River Mersey and they were there until midnight and they weren't the only boat there there was another boat called the John and that struck the Prince Regent and it knocked Albin Burt overboard and as he scrambled to get back on board a boat he boarded the John rather than the Prince Regent and left his nine year old son on his own thinking that his father had been washed out to sea no radios back then no life jackets no lifeboats no coast guards if you got washed overboard you were just washed out to sea at about four o'clock in the morning the Prince Regent beached on a sandbank and listed over to one side and the captain ordered everyone to scramble to shore the crew stayed on board and the 17 passengers made their way to dry land one of those passengers being Albin Burt's son only eight people survived and Albin Burt's nine-year-old son wasn't one of them his body was washed up in the River Mersey a few hours later on the 6th of December 1822 by all accounts Albin would spend many hours here in Parkgate walking up and down the seafront and he would collect pebbles and because of his artistic bent he decided to make a mural to his son outside the holiday cottage and his son's name was Nelson it's kind of a sad story that isn't it I think we should cheer up and have an ice cream Music